MetaDiff Plus then is a graphical language workbench that's been around for a while now. Um, mostly used in industry, but I think there are over a hundred universities now that use it too, so some academic use as well. I like that fade-in effect. Yeah, it's a very expensive fade-in effect. So I'm Steve Kelly, and I've been working on it since, goodness, 92. I'm going to show you the single-user version of MetaEdit and the multi-user version. We have two different versions because some different organizations have different work practices, but they're basically the, the same tool, it's just how they work with versioning and multi-user collaboration. Let's start MetaEdit up. And let's log into our first repository. So our repository in MetaEdit Plus is the biggest unit of information you can have and would correspond to your single XML file in a big XML files tool. Log in here, then we've got the, some of the examples from the previous years. Um, the previous years work and they've been updated then with the language for MITRE's wonderful framework now. So a small language update to cope with slight differences of domain understanding that happened there, but mostly just the generators. Um, let's just pick one example, for instance. Here's your most simple binary questionnaire. Is a number greater than four? If it is, we've got the blue for true. Is a number greater than six, and so on get to the end of the questionnaire. So that's a, a graphical tree representation of the information. Let's generate them. Just to show that things are working, I know that's not really the focus here. And we can answer, yes, it's greater than four, yes, it's greater than six, but no, it's not greater than seven. Okay. You get the basic idea. I'm not going to show you the generators or the code because I think it's all, it should all be pretty much the same between the tools. What about in the, the single user version then? Um, changing, changing things, how do people see the changes for collaboration with others? Let's open up a, here's a, a diagram from last, the last time around and some of the information is a bit out of date so Let's I'll change the date there to 2014. Not to the future. Yeah. I'm going to sell my house. Really going for it. And maybe, okay, there's another old date. So, okay, I could carry on and do some more work, but let's just imagine then I've done, done some work and I want to know now I'm going to version my repository and say, yeah, slants into version control. What, what did I actually change? Because after you've been working away for a while, you might not remember. And you can choose show changes, and that will open up the things that you have changed. Okay, so there you can see that one, and you can add that to your version notes and the, the other object there. So a quick, it's not a graphical diff, it's a graphical change display. Because we can't show the deleted object, for instance, doing it that way. Um, to do that, then you can do it the other way around, you have to be in the other repository. It's not really a good story yet for that, but for a single user working, and it's enough to be able to see the graphs where it works and what changes, what objects there have been changed, and be able to write his, his version comments. If you're in the Git SPN kind of world, then you can just press the version button and give yourself a version name, doesn't really matter what in this case, and Meta will commit the changes to the repository, as normally anyway, and it also runs. In this case, it zipped up the repository and pushed it. I have no version control set up here for that, but it would push it to your Git or your SPN. So the idea is you, you get to stay within the tool and work away from pushing it into version control. And but we're really that's, that's sort of basic stuff. I'll come back to the multi-user story later. I want to show you a bit about the scalability first, though. MetaEdit has quite a history in scalability because from early on we were fortunate to get some large customers, including one that had hundreds of users 
and quite a lot of data. So I'll show you possibly later with a bit more data in that side. These graphs here, I think the biggest one, um, well, we saw one with eight. There's one with 32. One of the things we noticed, just building this example, is that's all well and good for eight. But if you remember, if we're going to have eight questions, then we've got four in a line here. By the time you get up to 1,024 questions, <laughs> you're asking for a 100 megapixel screen, which unfortunately this is only less than one megapixel, so it doesn't really work that well. So we have to find a way to lay out things a bit better. And it turned out that the chip makers have an algorithm for laying out a tree in the smallest possible area, but still keeping the tree structure. So I actually implemented that into MetaEdit to do, to do layout. So this is now 1,024. Okay, that brief second there was it opening the graph for 1,024 into memory. Then actually I'm going to display it. You can just about see. <laughs> but there's quite a lot of stuff in there. It's called a, an H tree. I'll go back and show you. Not that one, but this one. And you get the idea that here's one block, like this is, the, this is the last stage of a question, that could be a two and one and a three. And then you split again into this side or that side. And then when you split again, you go vertically, you split again, you go horizontally. So at each split, it expands, but it doesn't do this horrible thing that fills up the whole, requires a massive graph, but most of which is empty, if you just do a simple uh, hierarchical tree. So, from the big one then, um, generation. I won't generate. I'll, I won't generate the uh, PNG here. I'll just go to one level down our generators. Then for the that big one then, that's two point six nine seconds uh, for a thousand questions. If you, you can probably see the cursor flickering, that means it's reading data from the repository. They haven't loaded all the data so far. They say properties, smaller properties within the objects. So if I run it again, it will get just the, just the time. It's about 2.1 seconds or something like that. Okay, 2.3 now, it varies. So for a thousand, and we can also go on and go a bit bigger. And that now is 2,000, so 11, there's the, the exponent, 2 to the 11. And it takes a little longer to open, because it reads the information in, a little longer to display. Once you've got it in there, okay, I mean, there's no, we can't humanly work with it, but if we try and create a relationship, I don't know if that shows up there. Let's see, then I can create the relationship in there still. <laughs> Um, the tree is now broken, it's not a tree, I think, with that, with that change, but if I now want to commit to write this to the repository, then that's how long it takes. Because we're not saving a big XML file, we only need to save the bits that have changed, and it knows whereabouts on the disk those bits are going to go, so you can just do the small change. So you can have a massive repository and it's not linear with the size of the repository, but it's O1, basically. It's almost a constant time, or O size of changes, to be able to save things in big O notation. So having got that far, up to 2,000, and um, out of there, and going to another repository, this five gigabyte one. <coughs> I'm going to type, first of all, I'm not going to open any of the projects. So a repository contains projects, contains graphs. Let's, I can leave the hierarchy on for now. I'll open one, one project. And you can see it takes a little while now to open, it's not instantaneous anymore to open something. I'm um, reading the information from the repository. But, this repository then, this is the, the five gigabyte one that some of you saw on Twitter. The reason it's five gigabytes is that 
um, early on in the history of one of our larger customer, then they sent us all of their repositories for us to do a change for them, a big change they didn't want to do manually or automate themselves. So I know how much data they have. And the total data for them with hundreds of users was five gigabytes. The other nice thing about the five gigabyte size, it, it's, I think most, most of the examples were two to the 10, so 1,024. This is two to the 20. So that's a fairly large tree. So now I've read it in. Each one of these graphs, I didn't bother making anything semantically sound here. They're all just the same. Uh, but no reuse between them, they're all independent. There, there's 120 objects in each graph. And 120 graphs in each project, 64 projects, which makes 2 to the 20. So, what about then generating from, from this? How does the tool cope when there's, there's lots? Okay, it's basically instantaneous, 0.2 seconds there. Because it's not dependent on the overall size of the repository just on the size of this graph, which I'm only generating this one graph now. What about opening the rest? Let's open 10 more projects. Okay, that's fast enough, we can go ahead and open them all. A little bit of flickering there for you, but that's, that's your million top level objects in the in those graphs. So there isn't really a problem in terms of scalability of overall size. I can go on and do more. Where this repository, when I left on Friday night to go home for the weekend to get ready to come here, I got home and I realized I didn't bring it. I forgot to copy it to my computer. So I know it's sitting there at work and it's five gigabytes. And that's gonna take a while to shift over the, the home connection. But I could zip it up at the far end. And it's probably going to compress quite well because it's repetitious. I started the zip, the zip said it's going to take, uh, it was at one hour and 40 minutes and going upwards when I gave up on it. So I started meta edit rebuilding the same thing because we built the algorithm there to create these kind of repository, these examples. And uh, in the end, I actually managed to get it with a, a lower kind of zip. But you start to hit all kinds of interesting problems when you reach data of this size that you don't normally hit in with normal customer, even big customer data. Um, what about changes then? Um, let's change. Okay. Well, this is the first. So there's one of the objects after these million now has changed and commit, then it's actually done. The writing of the commit, and you can, uh, you can see that the last bit is cache refresh. Half actually answered the question, but I'm not going to go away. <laughs> so again, it's not dependent on the amount of data you have, it's dependent on how many changes you make. And <laughs> that's, that size of repository is it's of the order of a thousand man years of work if you look back to our customer and how long they took to build stuff. So it's going to be fairly fast when you're actually working in normal cases. Okay, what about collaboration though then? Let's come out of here. And I'll start at the, the multi-user server. And that's just running now on a certain port. And I'm actually going to run all this on one computer with the server and two clients now as an example. And of course the clients are Angelo. <laughs> yeah, why you? And trying to, and to try and get some kind of distinction. Okay, mind is now a Mac guy, whether you liked it or not. I'm afraid the fonts will be quite right on here. Meta it can adapt to the the platform, different platforms which it sets. So it can even do Mac look and feel on Windows, but the fonts obviously aren't here because we don't have this in the or whatever it is in there. Uh, I'll just make this color a bit different so you can see a bit more easily. Okay, so he's, he's green. 
because he's a Mac user. A Mac user's green. Actually, Apple have just turned green, haven't they? Because they've started following the, the declaration of what horrible bits of child labor and illegal substances they used to make the, the Macs out of. So now they're green. Um, let's take this one example then where here's Angelo is working on the top on a top level graph. Question four. Top question four of eight. Obviously split into a subgraph. The other part of that. So that's the reusable bit. If we open Mantis work now, then this is actually a reusable bit of a questionnaire in these binary questionnaires, because this starts from two goes down to one and three. So this is usable on its own as the questionnaire for four numbers, and also as part of a larger one. The other half of it, five, six, seven, eight, then you can't really reuse that because it's only usable as part of, or maybe it's the next one of as well. So what can we do then? Well, the, the actual task was if Angela, I'm going to read my notes just for a second. First of all, yeah, I want to see that we can look at graph info, it will tell us, is locked by Angela, I probably can't say it from the back, but he knows he's got the lock on that. And so he can move things around and change things. If he then changes this question, say question 4a, now we'll give it a new name, then that, in theory at least, that's going to break Mantis work that knows he's dependent on question 4 as to whether he shows this stuff. So he's made that change. Mind you can look. Look at that. What kind of multi-user version is this? You can't see it. They're out of sync. Why do we do that? Why does Meta choose to have things? So you can't see the changes. The whole point of collaboration is I should see your changes. The answer is the way developers work, that if I'm programming old style and someone's given me, we've got, or oh, Angela and Mike are programming old style, that's how you program, isn't it? Old style. You get the requirements on a piece of paper or the high level design on a piece of paper. It's the latest version that Mike has made. And if you printed it out and you're working based on that. Until you get the new version that he's worked on, figured out, saved, you printed this out. You're going to do your work based on a single, consistent, single point of time version of mind is done. Because that's much better than seeing his state of work right now at this very second in his editor, where he could have anything going on and everything would break. So at the moment, although we have in one sense inconsistency because of the time difference here, I can run, or Angela can run a build and it will work fine. Reminder run his build in the same top level graph and it's going to work fine. So that's the important thing. We can't have things breaking just because someone else is working in the same models. We have to wait till their work is consistent. Okay. So we've got to have mine to do a change as well so we've got a bit of conflict going on. Okay, you can have two A there is this top level question. So Angela now, uh, very good screen real estate as you can see. <laughs> he can commit his change to the repository. He's made it, he's generated, he's checked it works. Now if you thought it was bad before the collaboration, what are you going to think about this? Mantin now looks, he still doesn't see that change. Why doesn't he see the change? Any database guys here? Relational database guys. Oh, the room is empty. There's no SQL room. Brilliant. <laughs> Acid transactions. You heard of those? Oh, that's good. Um, I think it's a C, isn't it? Consistent in that means that Mantis' view of the repository must stay the same throughout his transaction. Otherwise, we get exactly the same problem I was talking about before. If now suddenly he saw that one change, then it's inconsistent with what he was working on before. So he sees that. He sees his version still. 
until he commits and starts a new transaction. And now automatically, you can see it's updated. He can, I'll go to the, yeah, he can build. And now it's going to work for him. Okay, we don't have to go for it. So, those kind of changes where two people are working together and there's some kind of link between their work, then they're common, relatively common um, in software development. If you look at changes where two people want to change the same element, the same name of an object, say, then they're uncommon. There's some research in the 90s that actually looked at software developers working, and it's below three changes in every thousand changes are what they call right right conflicts. Two people write the same object. So there's not that much point trying to optimize for that case. You want to optimize for the 997 cases where there isn't a conflict. And that's what using methods based on repositories you've seen. Using a repository rather than, say, XML files optimizes for the 997 cases. So when we save things, we don't need to save everything into the repository. We just save what's changed. We don't need to worry about conflicts most of the time. We just lock the objects. If I go in, um, now as Minder, you, you can probably see that that's great. I can't actually move this object around. Because Angelo opened that. He, has to lock, he still has it open. He has to lock on that. Now, if I open, let's open another one here. I'm going to open with shift down now as Angelo. And that's the way of telling MetaEdit, just a quick way of telling it. I'm just looking at this graph. So if Mindy opens the same one, then now Mindy has the lock. And he can change things, add objects, and so on. Whereas Angela said, I, I'm just looking, just visiting. So actually, that's pretty much what I wanted to show you. Um, Do you have any questions? Um, how do you resolve merge conflicts then? I mean, so that there aren't going to be, right? Because there's lots on my model elements. So that, that was a merge situation that you saw. Angela made a change, Mike made a change. And it was a merge with a non conflicting merge, if you like. I mean, the, the whole definition of what's conflicting and what's not is kind of a semantics issue, it depends on the language. In a well-built language, then it pretty much maps onto <coughs> what technically is a, a conflict. If if you're writing in into C files, say, and the equivalent of that non-conflicting non merge that I had there would be the who was doing what. Angela would change the name of a function, and you would make a call to the old name of the function in your C file. Now, technically, that's not a right right conflict. It's not a conflict. The your software won't who just do people have software now that sorts that out if you're doing textual versioning that spots that you've called something and its name has been changed on the versioning level and other compiler will get it. No. So you're screwed basically with that. Here there's no problem. So we go further than the, the technical conflict management of version management tools. But like you said if you, you physically can't edit the same object, two of you. But let's say at the moment, Minder has the lock here on the structure of this graph, which means he can change things like that. But at the same time, Angela, who doesn't have a lock on the graph, he can still get a lock on an individual object. So he can't move that object around, because that would be two people fighting over does the object go left or right? It's crazy. But he can change that because that doesn't create a conflict, semantically. It doesn't really matter what its name is or where it is. You can't have two people fighting over the name or two people fighting over where it is. So this is a very different way, I think, than most people do collaboration. But because it copes with the 997 out of 1,000, it seems to fit the way people actually work quite well. 
so you don't spend your time thinking, I wanted to change that and I can't. It just really happens very rarely. <coughs> and most of the time, things that would be conflicts the version control could take care of before, or conflicts that miss before, they just happen and they just work. <coughs> Yeah. So this is a centralized server. So we need to support decentralized uh, uh, collaboration. So for the yeah, it's an interesting question. A good one. The you can't do it if you don't have them able to talk to each other. Okay. These huge repositories that Google and Facebook and so on have that are sort of consistent and eventually consistent with all kinds of variants on that. Unfortunately, that's not good enough for software engineering. <laughs> sort of works when you're building aeroplanes and things, then customers get annoyed if they only sort of work. So, no, what, what we actually do, what clients do, obviously you can use, say you're on a business trip, and obviously you can still link into home if you've got a VPN or whatever, but what actually seems to work better is there's a machine running and internal services or your own computer at work and you log into that via a remote desktop. And the, the bandwidth of desktop interaction is smaller than the bandwidth of the data, especially if you've got five gigabytes that you want to pull over the line. So people tend to do that. But you, you need internet. Yeah, yeah, you need internet. If, you, if you're offline, then you're reduced to very limited ability to work. And we've done some tests with it that you can pre-lock stuff, because otherwise, if you can't get the lock, ahead of time, then you can't protect people. Uh, and it does sort of work, but it's not its not ideal. So this is basically designed for people who are, or works best with people who are, let's say, co-located or on a limited number of sites. In the cases where they're not, they don't use the multi-user version. They use the single user version, they divide work up into, here's your module. And there's um, just a textual level link that you have to get that Q, Q4, has to be the same across two different repositories, you just have to remember that. So that, obviously, most software development works like that anyway. You have to have the same name, so that, that can work too. And actually, that largest client we had, and they were working in that mode. Yeah, Enrico. Uh, I, I, I didn't understand how I can make a branch. You don't. You, I, I can. You can. Of course you can. You can, make a, you can make a copy of the repository and branch out. But the idea is not. The whole repository must be there. Yeah. yeah. The idea is not to do that. Most of our. In the olden days when branching was invented, it was to make two different versions of the same product. Uh, sorry, two different kinds of the same product. Uh, nowadays it's used mostly for collaboration between two developers working on the same eventual product. And for that, you don't need to do it. You just carry on working and all your changes happen together in one repository. For real branching, you push that up into the language level where you specify variation between two different variants of the same product, let's say. But that's out of scope just now. I'll talk to you later about that. That's not the real reason, the real reason for it. If you want to branch because you have to actually, in your terms, a bigger commit connection, you have to change more, which you work on over days, and then you want to commit. Yeah, you yeah, can have cost difficult in such an environment because you need to uh, keep your changes on. Yeah, but you can have you can have long transactions in here, yeah. so you can have transactions that last over days. Right? It becomes less and less ideal in a sense. Yeah, but <coughs> it's certainly the tool supports that. That's a better approach. Okay. Thanks. Thanks.